right? The title of the sermon this morning is derived from verse number 7. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 9, verse number 7, the Bible says this, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. The title of the sermon is Not of Necessity. Not of necessity. I'm going to be preaching this morning on the subject of free will offerings. Free will offerings. Now, obviously, the reason why is because today we're going to be taking up a free will offering. <coughs> after the church service today, immediately before we sing our last hymn, after I end the prayer, we're going to go ahead and we're going to pass around the offering plate for a free will offering today. Now, number one, I want everyone to understand the doctrine in the Bible, because everything in the Bible is a doctrine. And, you know, these are all teachings. So before you ever put anything into practice, and I don't care how small it is, you need to have a good understanding of it. Before you ever decide to do something, you need to know what you're doing when it comes to you know, teachings and things that are, that are found in the Word of God, number one. Now, number two, let me say this as well. I want to make a few introductory remarks. Let me say this as well in the very beginning. We can continually grow in knowledge of all things. A person may think, you know, well, it's free will offerings. I mean, how simple can it be? I mean, it's of our free will and we just give it. Don't ever have that attitude about anything. Because I guarantee that you're going to walk away this morning and there's going to be something that you learn from this sermon. A lot of times, also, when you think something is so simple in the Bible, sometimes it's you that's simple. Sometimes you just have a, a very shallow understanding of a subject that's much deeper, and then you grow in knowledge. And I, this has happened to me where I think I can't learn much more about that subject, maybe. And then I study the Word of God, and maybe somebody you know, will uh, show me a cross-reference that I had never noticed, and it opens up a whole new tunnel down of knowledge in that particular subject. So never think in any area, in the Word of God as whole, that you know the Word of God you know, in a fullest sense, or even a, a, a particular doctrine or a subject. Never think that you're just, you've arrived in that particular area. You can always grow in every subject with more knowledge in every doctrine of the Bible. Amen. Now, uh, number two, I want to say this in the very beginning. I'm not going to be touching on this as far as spending a lot of time teaching on tithing. But you need to have at least somewhat of an understanding of tithing in the Bible to understand the free will offering. Because there's really two types of offerings that are given in the Bible. They go by different name, names, but they fall into two categories, two of them. There is pretty much the tithe, and then there is the free will offering. Now, the tithe is mandatory. That's why you need to understand that essentially these are the two differences. The tithe is mandatory. It is something that is a commandment of God. It is something that it is a law. And God commands, hey, and the word tithe means 10% of your income, you know, you should give to the, the church, to the congregation. Of course, uh, trying to be inclusive with Old Testament and New Testament, use general words. You should bring to the congregation 10% of your income. That is the tithe. The Old Testament, they took it to what was at that time, what they would say is the house of God, the temple, didn't they? They brought it to the temple, they're 10%. In the New Testament, the house of God is the church, the Bible says. And we meet in a particular location, we bring it to the congregation, and you give your tithe then. If you do not tithe, and, and let me say this too. If I hairlift you this morning, I don't care at all. Because here's the thing. All of these pastors, they're so afraid to preach about every single subject in the Bible. I'm making no bones about Just because we're talking about money and people get offended about it, I don't care. Not even a tiny bit. If this sermon offends you, I'm preaching the Bible and your heart's not right. Don't say anything to me. If everything that I preach this morning is out of the Bible, you're the problem, not me. If I stand up here and preach on fornication and you get offended, well, then you may have some sin in your life. That's probably why. You know, if I stand up here and preach on adultery, well, God forbid, you may have some sin or evil thoughts, wicked thoughts in your, in your heart or in your, you know, your mind. Pastors are too afraid to preach on every, just every stinking subject in the Bible today. And I don't care what it is. If, you, if this bothers you, then you might be a covetous person. Maybe you need to check your heart. Because free will offerings are biblical. You know, if, you know, if it bothers you that to go to a church to take up a free will offering one time a year, there's something wrong with your heart, my friend. There, there truly and truly is. So, so don't stand up here and think, oh, he's just asking for money. Exactly. The church runs by money. You know, that, that, what do you, how do you think the, the electricity is on here? How do you think we pay for this building to meet it all the time? You have to have money in order to run the church. You know, and I'm going to get into that a little bit more, so I don't want to jump ahead of myself. 
So the, the word tithe means 10%. It is a commandment to give that 10%. That is the essential or the, or the, the, the major difference, the core difference between the free will offering. Because the free will offering is not a commandment at all. You cannot give a free will offering or you can give a free will offering. Either way, it doesn't matter. If you give a free will, as far as commandments of God, if you give, uh, if you don't give a tithe, you're sinning against God. It's a right. sin. Yeah, that, that, it's a sin not to bring your tithe to the church. It really, truly is. And, and, and I may touch on this as well, because this is still the introduction of the sermon, but it doesn't change in the New Testament. That's a ridiculous teaching that no longer, the tithing no longer is, is valid in the New Testament. That's, that's foolishness. Now, free will offering is not like that at all. Let me say this this morning. You know, this may make a lot of you feel better. If you don't give a free will offering at all, you're not sinning against God at all. If you never give a free will offering in your entire life, that's not a sin at all. Not even a tiny bit because it is truly not of necessity. Everybody's like, <laughs> thank the Lord, right? It, it really is. It's not, it's, not a, it's not a commandment in the Bible. You have to understand what it truly means to be a free will offering. And it seems very simple, but a lot of people, I'm sure, are at least to some degree confused on this. You are not required to give a free will offering at all, period. And that's actually what's explained here. Let's read this verse. We're going to be coming back to this. We're going to look at it in the Old Testament. I'm going to show that this is an Old Testament teaching and a New Testament teaching. But I want you to look here... In the New Testament, first, where we're at, 2 Corinthians chapter number 9, verse number 7, it says this, verse 6 as well. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Verse 7, every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, look at what it says next. So not grudgingly or of necessity. What does that mean? It means it's not necessary. In your heart, he does not want you to think that this is necessary. What is something that, that's necessary? Needed. Saying he doesn't want you to think or he doesn't want you to be under the impression that this is something that is necessary. He doesn't want this to be compulsory from the church. He doesn't want this to be compulsory from the word of God because it is meant to be just that, a free will offering. So that's the, those are the two types of offerings in the Bible. There is the tithe which is a commandment of God, the 10% of the income, but then there also is the free will offering, which is not of necessity. He does not want it to be grudgingly where you are just feel forced and you're just like, oh my gosh, I'm not, I just gave my stick and tithe and now i got to get more. That's, see, that's the wrong attitude. Right, right. That's grudgingly giving your money, isn't right. it? That's the exact opposite of what God wants. So we're going to look here. This is uh, We're going to find the foundation of this teaching of the free will offering in the Old Testament, of course. It goes back to the Old Testament law. So I want you to go to Numbers chapter number 15. Numbers chapter number 15. <coughs> Numbers chapter number 15. The book of Numbers. Numbers chapter number 15. We're going to begin reading verse number 1. So there are, let me say this too, and, and, and make sure you follow because this is where you can have a very shallow understanding. There are restrictions and there are regulations to the free will offering. It's not required that you give, but if you do, there are certain uh, uh, you know, uh, regulations and restrictions that you are to follow when you give. So that's what we're going to look at here first in Numbers 15. We're going to begin reading in verse number 1. If they were uh, a, ch a child of Israel, if they were to decide to bring a, a free will offering, this is what they would have to follow. Look at verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye be come into the land of your habitations, which I give unto you, and will make an offering by fire unto the Lord, a burnt offering or a sacrifice in performing a vow. Now, I want to point that out to you. Because a vow is a type of free will offering. So it says this. In performing a vow or in a free will offering. Or in your solemn feast to make a sweet savor unto the Lord of the herd or of the flock. And he goes on. I want you to pay attention here. Then shall he that offereth his offering unto the Lord bring a meat offering. And that is not referring to uh, like flesh. The Bible uses the word flesh when it speaks of things like beef and stuff like that. When the Bible uses the word meat, it just means food. So bringing a food offering, right? So this, these are the regulations of the free will offering. If you wanted to bring a free will offering in the Old Testament, this is what you would do. 
They would bring a meat offering of a tenth deal of flour mingled with the fourth part of a hen of oil. And the fourth part of a hen of, of wine for a drink offering shalt thou prepare with the burnt offering or sacrifice for one lamb. Or for a ram thou shalt prepare for a meat offering two tenth deals of flour mingled with the third part of a hen of oil. Verse 7, And for a drink offering thou shalt offer the third part of a hen of wine for a sweet savor unto the Lord. And when thou preparest a bullock for a burnt offering or for a sacrifice and performing a vow or peace offerings unto the Lord, then shall he bring with a bullock a meat offering of three-tenths deal of, of uh, sorry, flour mingled with half a hen of oil. Verse 10. And thou shalt bring for a drink offering half a hen of wine for an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. So he goes on there and there's some more other regulations that are that are explained. But notice that there are there's a specific pattern that they are to follow. It's not compulsory. They're not forced to bring a free will offering, but if they decided to bring a free will offering, there were certain restrictions and regulations of what they were to offer. He, he had things specifically that he wanted them to bring at that time. I want you to turn in your Bible to Leviticus chapter number 22, verse number 17. Leviticus chapter number 22, verse number 17. We're going to see here uh, the, some of the, uh, the stress or the emphasis on it being uh, free will, of your own will. Saying you are the one that decided this. You, you are the one that, uh, you know, that, that came about with this idea in your own heart and decided, hey, it's not a commandment, but I want to bring a free will offering. I want to give. You know, a, 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 an offering unto the Lord, to the house of the Lord. Look at Leviticus 22, verse number 17. It says this, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and to his sons, and unto all the children of Israel, and say unto them, Whatsoever he be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers in Israel, that will offer his oblation, that's just like a sacrifice, for all his vows, or for all his free will offerings. Notice how vows and free will offerings keep getting put together, right? Think about a vow just in general. I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but think about a vow in general. Is a vow something in the Bible that's forced? No, God says don't, you don't have to vow. He says if you're going to break the vow, don't vow in the first place. Further proving that it's of your own heart, isn't it? It's of your own what? Free will. It's voluntary. So a vow is also like a free will, right? It's, it's something along the lines of a free will offering because when they vowed, they also had to bring an offering, Right? You can bring an offering without it being a vow, though. You can just bring a free will offering just because. I feel like just bringing an offering unto the Lord, bringing it unto the house of the Lord. If you vow a vow, you are also required to bring an offering, and that also would fall under the category of a free will offering. And there's one other type of, of offering that is also a free will offering we'll get to in just a minute. So I want to point that out to you to help you better understand what a vow is in the Bible and the offering that was, uh, that was related to it. So it says, and for all his free will offerings, which they will offer unto the Lord for a burnt offering. Verse 19, he shall offer at your own will a male without blemish of the beeves, of the sheep, or of the goats. Beeves is like, think of the word beef right there. It's talking about a cow, a bovine. Now in verse 19, notice it says, ye shall offer at your own will. Notice the stress right there, your own will. So what is it? Just further emphasize the fact that this is of your own free will. It's of your own heart. You decide, hey, I want to bring this offering. No one ever brings this up to you. You're just living your everyday life. But here's the thing. God go, he goes ahead and he sets out regulations. If you decide to bring an offering to me, just because these are the regulations and these are the restrictions. So think about the situation of the Old Testament Israel. They have all of these commandments. They have all of these offerings that they are required to bring at certain times, aren't they? They're sin offerings. You have, if you sin, you are required to bring a specific offering to the house of the Lord. You know, for, you know there, there are other types, and we'll get into this in a moment. There's peace offerings. There's vows. There's, uh, you know, um, there are, uh, uh, what are some of the other offerings? I can't think of any right now. Anybody think of any? Tra the, the, there's one that, and it's, I think it's transgression. Does it use the word transgression, I believe? Yeah, but I mean, it's the same as a sin offering. Maybe it's just interchangeable. I can't remember right now. But there's multiple offerings. There's numerous different style of offerings. Sometimes they'll use synonymous words for them. But there's numerous offerings that they would bring. Now, amongst these offerings, these are, these are offerings that I'm speaking of that are required. So you have to bring these on certain times. 
But if you decided outside of these offerings, hey, I want to bring an offering just because. Just because it entered into my own heart. Just because I just feel like giving an offering, the, the, the Bible, God, would refer to that as a free will offering. And these are the regulations or these are the restrictions. Now, no one forces you to do this at all. This is, as it says, of your own will. Look at verse number 20. But whatsoever hath a blemish, that shall ye not offer, for it shall not be acceptable for you. Verse 21. Whosoever offer the sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord to accomplish his vow. Notice that. How the peace offering is what's offered to accomplish the vow. This is also what's considered a type of free will offering. And then he goes on, or a free will offering. In beeves or sheep, it shall be perfect. That means complete, has no problems to be accepted. There shall be no blemish therein. And he goes on to talk about some of the more of the restrictions of what is acceptable to be offered and what is not. I want you to go to Deuteronomy chapter number 23, verse number 23. After the book of Numbers there, Deuteronomy chapter number 23, verse number 23. The free will offering works exactly the same as the vow. If you decide in your heart and you, and you say that you are going to give a free will offering, God says you are going to give a free will offering. If you decide that you are going to vow, if you make a vow, you should fulfill that vow. God says you should fulfill that vow. Now, here's the thing. If you say you're going to give a free will offering... You publicly say that, you plan to do so, you, 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 uh, you know, uh, mark this in your heart, you make note of this in your heart, and you say, I'm doing this, and then you don't do it. The Bible teaches that as sin. Just like a vow. If you vow a vow, and you didn't have to vow this vow, it's voluntary, it's of your own will. But you vow a vow, you decide to do so, and then you don't fulfill the vow, you don't perform the vow, you sin against the Lord now. Now, God didn't, didn't, he did not you know, compel you to vow in the first place. He did not command you to vow. You decided to, right? But if you then don't follow through, you've now sinned against the Lord. Same thing with the free will offering. I want you to look at Deuteronomy chapter number 23, verse number 23. It says this, That which is gone out of thy lips thou shalt keep and perform, even a free will offering according as thou hast vowed unto the Lord thy God, which thou hast promised with thy mouth. So notice how a vow is, again, it's, it's intertwined with the free will offering, isn't it? Because when you vow a vow, the type of offering that you would bring, sometimes the Bible is referred to as like a peace offering, depending on what type of vow it is. Sometimes it's referred to as a free will offering. That's the purpose of the offering. Overall, in general, both of them, even a peace offering, is a type of a free will offering. Keep in mind, there's two types of offerings overall. They fall in, all of them fall into two categories, basically. There's the mandatory types of offerings, and then over here there are the free will offerings. Under the free will offerings are vows, peace offerings, and then just the free will offering in general where you just feel like bringing it. It's not because of a vow. It's not because of any sort of you know, a, a, a peace covenant or anything like that. It's just a free will offering. I want you to turn now. Go, to, go with me to uh, Leviticus chapter number 22. Leviticus chapter number 22. Leviticus chapter number 22. We're going to look at uh, verse number 29. So this is going to kind of give you another idea of some of the types of free will offerings. Leviticus 22, verse number 29. Leviticus chapter 22, verse number 29. It says this. And when ye will offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving unto the Lord... Offer it at your own will. Now, I want you to notice that. What does it say? It says, when you decide to offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving. What does he say? Offer it at your own will. So this tells you that what a, a, a thanksgiving offering, if you will. It's not referred to that, I don't believe. Maybe it is later on in this chapter one time. But this type of offering, an offering of thanksgiving is what? It's also a free will offering. It falls underneath that same category. Now, this is very important. I want, I want you to, uh, to take note of this and to notice what it's saying here is that this is a free will offering for what reason? What's the name of the type of offering? An offering of thanksgiving, right? So notice it's a free will offering for what reason? What compelled this? Thanksgiving, to give thanks. This is the reason why, we're going to see this repeatedly here in a moment, but this is the reason why someone gives a free will offering in the first place. Now I want you to uh, look down 
uh, with me. Actually, go back. It's in the same book, Leviticus. I want you to go back to Leviticus chapter number 1, verse number 3. Leviticus chapter number 1, verse number 3. I'm going to read you here uh, and finish this chapter, a couple of verses in Leviticus chapter 22, where we were. Verse number 30 says this, On the same day it shall be eaten up, you shall leave none of it until tomorrow. I am the Lord. And then he goes on, Therefore shall ye keep my commandments and do them. I am the Lord. So notice that if you decide to do a free will offering, there are commandments along with that once you've decided Right? you understand what I'm saying? So don't get this confused. This is where someone may think that, hey, I, I understand free will offering. It's very simple. Now, it's not as simple as you may think it is because when you decide, when you vow a vow to give an offering, to give a peace offering, to give any type of thanksgiving offering, whatever it may be, it falls under the category of a free will offering. Well, now you've stepped in and, and in a sense, now there are, there are all these, not in a sense, there are commandments that you must follow when giving the free will offering. You were the one that decided and said, I'm going to give a free will offering to begin with. But once you do so, it must, it must go about a certain pattern. It must go about a certain way when you bring the offering for it to be acceptable unto the Lord. So I want you to notice that. Look at Leviticus chapter number 1, verse number 3. We're going to read a few verses here where it just mentions in general. It talks about the subject of a free will offering or of his own will. Look at Leviticus chapter 1, verse 3. It says this, If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. Now notice again, what is it referring to? A free will offering. Saying it's voluntary. Saying it is not mandatory. It is not forced. You are the one that decided to do this. You are the one that wanted to do this. But if you do, you need to do X, Y, and Z, right? You need to do A, B, and C. There are then regulations or restrictions to bringing the free will offering. I want you to go to uh, Leviticus chapter 7, verse 16. Leviticus chapter number 7, verse number 16. I'm going to read you from Ezekiel chapter number 46. Ezekiel chapter number 46, verse number 12. Says this now when the prince shall prepare a voluntary burnt offering or peace offerings voluntarily. So notice again, peace offerings are a type of free will offering, it's voluntary, it's of your own will. Unto the Lord one shall then open him the gate that looketh toward the east, and he shall prepare his burnt offering and his peace offerings as he did on the Sabbath day. Then he shall go forth, and after his going forth, one shall shut the gate. So I had to turn where? Leviticus 7. Look at verse number 16. Leviticus 7, 16, it says this. But if the sacrifice of his offering be a vow or a voluntary offering, it shall be eaten the same day that he offereth his sacrifice. And on the morrow, also, the remainder of it shall be eaten. So notice, over and over again. So right now, I want you to turn to Deuteronomy 16. We're going to learn some more from Deuteronomy 16. That was more of the foundation of understanding how they were to give an offering. I wanted you to see the word voluntary of his own will. I want you to get that point in your mind. That is a major thing to understand about a free will offering is that it's voluntary. Let me say this. Dude, when we pass that offering plate around today, I don't want anyone to feel compelled in their heart to give anything. I don't want you to feel like, hey, I saw Brother Anthony put this much in, so I better put in that much. I don't want anyone to, to feel if they see everyone else dropping money in the plate, that in and itself should not compel you to put money in that offering plate. That should not be something that it should, you should not feel forced to put anything in the offering plate today. That would defeat the purpose of a free will offering. You know what it just became? It's not a free will offering anymore. It's no longer a free will offering, my friend, at all, period. Now it's just falling into the same category as all the, other, all the other offerings. So I want you to go to Deuteronomy chapter number 16. Now, and we're going to look here at Deuteronomy 16. Now I want to show you the reason why people give free will offerings. All the lousy Christians are thinking, man, if I'm not forced to do it, then why am I doing it in the first place? Well, there are reasons why people give a free will offering. There's reasons why in the Old Testament... And it's the same exact reasons in the New Testament. I'm going to show you that in just a minute. Look at Deuteronomy 16. I want you to look at verse number 10. Deuteronomy chapter number 16, 
verse number 10, it says this, And thou shalt keep the feast of weeks unto the Lord thy God with a tribute of a freewill offering of thine hand, which thou shalt give unto the Lord thy God, according as the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. Verse 11, And thou shalt rejoice before the Lord thy God, thou and thy son and thy daughter and thy manservant and thy maidservant and the Levite that is within thy gates, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow that are among you in the place which the Lord thy God hath chosen to place his name there. Now let me explain a couple of things. Number one, I can see a person being uh, confused with verse number 10 to, to, to possibly think that it's now being forced or it's a commandment. That, that defeats the, the purpose of a free will offering. That's not what he's saying. So during the, the feast, there are other, other types of sacrifices that are given at certain times. But he's, he's saying this. If anyone during this time of the feast, they, they want to give a free will offering, this is the type of offering you're going to give. You shall give a free will offering. He knows someone is going to offer. You understand what I'm saying? God knows someone's going to want to bring an offering. Someone is going to bring an offering. And when you give an offering, thou shalt bring a free will offering of your head. That's what he's saying. We see over and over again, understand the word and what it means to be a free will offering. It's repeatedly of your own voluntary will. He said that it comes out of your own heart even. Did you notice that earlier? It says, that, you know, if it, it, uh, you know, the offering that you decide to do in your own heart, he says, uh, and, and whatever comes out of your mouth, he says, you shall perform to do it. I don't remember verbatim, but that's the concept. Whatever's in your heart, you decide it. It's voluntary. It's of your own free will. So you're not being forced. If you decide to do it, this is the regulations and the restrictions. Well, what he's saying here is during this time, during this feast, if anyone wants to give an offering, they shall give a free will offering. He's explaining to you what type of offering to give when you do offer because he knows you'll offer, right? So keep that in mind. I want that to be understood. It's not compulsory. It is not mandatory. Mandatory. It is voluntary, right? It is not. It is of your own free will. It is not forced, okay? Look at... Uh, Look at the next verse there. We read verse, uh, I want to point this out. Verse number 10 again at the very end. It says this, according as the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. Now, that's important to understand saying, you know, how God has blessed you in that way you should give an offering, right? Well, right after that, he says in verse number 11, and thou shalt what? Rejoice. I want you to notice this. We're going to see these words coming up repeatedly with the free will offering. What was one of the other reasons they said that you would give an offering? An offering, a free will offering. It was an offering of what? Thanksgiving. Notice that. So it's an offering of thanksgiving. It's according as he has blessed thee. A person that's blessed is what? Happy, right? It says right here, I want you to rejoice when you're doing it, or when you give the free will offering, you will be rejoicing. Look at verse number 12. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in Egypt, and thou shalt observe and do these statutes. Verse 13. Thou shalt observe the feast of tabernacles seven days. After that thou hast uh, gathered in thy corn and thy wine. Look at verse 14 again. It says this. And thou shalt rejoice in thy feast. Thou and thy son and thy, and thy daughter and thy manservant and thy maidservant and the Levites. So notice again he says, and thou shalt rejoice. Notice the word rejoice again. Keep reading. Uh, stranger and the fatherless and the widow that are within thy gates. Seven days shalt thou keep a solemn feast unto the Lord thy God in the place which the Lord shall choose. Because the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thine increase and in all the works of thine hands. One more time. Therefore thou shalt surely rejoice. Verse 16. Three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, in the feast of unleavened bread, and in the uh, feast of weeks, and in the feast of tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty. Every man shall give as he is able, look at that, according to the blessing of the Lord thy God, which he hath given thee. So a few things I want you to notice. Number one, the, the, the free will offering is an offering of what? Thanksgiving we saw earlier. Not only that, it's voluntary. It's of your own will. It's not compulsory. It is you, you deciding that you want to do it. Now what's the reason why? What would compel a person if it's not forced, if it's not mandatory, let's say outside of the Feast of Weeks, let's say outside of the Feast of Tabernacles, what would compel you if it's not mandatory? 
Because you just wake up one day and you say, man, look at the way the Lord has blessed me. Look at what God has done for me in my life. Look around at all my children. Look around at my home. Look around at my church. Look at everything that God has done for me. And what would you do? You would be rejoicing, wouldn't you? You would be happy. You would, be, you would look around and say, man, I am blessed. You know, all the people that are like, man, it's not forced. Why would you do that? Maybe you're not joyful, my friend. Maybe you're not thankful to God. You know what it is? It's an act of gratification. It's an act of, of gratitude is what it is. It's an act of gratitude. It's an act of, of being thankful, of thankfulness. That's why over and over again, what do we see? They're rejoicing. You're going to rejoice. You're going to rejoice because God blessed you, because I gave you all these things. What's going to happen? You're going to rejoice, and then as a result, you're going to give a free will offering. When you give, then, of course, he has the regulations and everything, right? But what? So what compels them? It's of their own heart. Because they're rejoicing, because they're thankful for everything that God has given them. But I want you to notice this too. He says, I want you to give as you're able. You know what that means? Some people will give a different amount than others. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? You know, all these people that in their mind, if you're just sitting here and thinking like, man, you know, I don't really have that much to rejoice about because God really has, hasn't given me that much. Well, then you, you're missing it, my friend. He's supposed to give as he is able. You may, one person is going to be able, or you know, he'll, he'll have the ability to give a different amount than someone else. But you know what? They're both happy and rejoicing in what God has given them. Amen. And people today, especially in our society, are so focused on materialism, and they don't realize all of the other things that God has done for you in your life. You know, the fact that you have, the, you have a, a, you know, a good church to go to. I mean, isn't that a major, you know, a bonus that you have a great church to go to? Amen. No, no, on top of that, you know, look at all the, the, the great friends that we have, all the great fellowship that we have here. Look at all the children that we have. God bless it. You know, the world is very confused today where they look at children as being a burden. Children are a blessing. Amen. Children bring happiness. Amen. Children should cause you to rejoice and be happy. Amen. You know, they shouldn't cause you to be, you know, uh, upset and, and all of these things and thinking, oh, my gosh, my wife is 37 weeks along. You know, that's, that's actually, that's literal. And she's going to, we're going to be having another baby and I have all these payments on it. Children are a blessing. Be thankful for what you have. Be thankful for the children that you have and all the kids that God has given you. Amen. Be thankful to God. Amen. How dare you stand up and say, I don't have as much to be thankful for that person as that person does. So I'm just not going to rejoice. Be thankful for what God gave you. And I'm sure there's areas in your life where God's blessed you more than so and so. I'm sure there's areas the opposite where the other person's blessed more than you. You know, we need to be thankful and rejoice for all the things that God has given to us. We need Amen. to be thankful every once in a while, not just once a year, not just in Thanksgiving. Why don't you wake up one morning and say, man, I am thankful that I am you know, 29 years old. I'm thankful that I have a house. I'm thankful that I have a job. I'm thankful that I have a wife. I'm grateful for God that I have a good church to go to, that I live in a country that I can go door-to-door -door soul winning, that I can pick up my Bible and read it without persecution like many people in the past, that I have many children. I'm thankful for all that God has given to me. Amen. You are way more blessed than a lot of people right. that are even more happy than you are. Right. There's a lot of people that are more grateful and more thankful than you are, and they have a lot less, or maybe even present day living today have a lot less, and they're a lot more grateful and thankful than you are. You need to be thankful for whatever God gives you. And you Amen. need to rejoice. You need to be happy. You need to be thankful to God and be grateful to God. Amen. This should be something you're doing constantly. You know, when I was taught to pray as a child, there were certain things that I was, that I was taught, hey, this is how you should pray. I was taught, you know, number one, you need to, of course, praise God and glorify God. You need to, you know, if you have something you need to pray about and ask for, because that's what the word prayer means, ask, you ask for that in your prayers too. But you know what else? I was taught in every single prayer you should do, you should thank God. Every time you pray to God, every day you should thank Him. Every single time. Every prayer that you make, you should thank God. You should start your prayers off for thanking God. Amen. He's the creator of all the world. He's before all things. There's, you know, it's impossible for anybody to have ever given to him that he has to pay them back. Right. Everything that you have, he gave you before you were ever even a thought in, in, in anyone's mind, before you ever existed. Be thankful to God for what you have. And don't have this. You know, if, if, you, if you desire more things and you're not happy because of that, then you're covetous. You have sin in your heart. That's the problem. Right. 
That's the issue if you're not thankful for what you have. Notice how both these things get, go together, too. Think about that. The person that gets offended if I stand up here and preach about giving, that's like what? It would be more like a covetous person. It would be a person thinking, I don't have that much. I can't give. I have nothing to give. Right? That's the same person that's not going to want to give because they're not thankful for what they do have. Right. Think about that. It's irritating. Because you, a lot of these people that, that, that you know, are the ones that are talking about, oh, I don't have enough money to tithe. I can't pay my bills if I tithe. You know, it just doesn't work out for me. You know, and those are the same people that say, oh, well, it's not a New Testament teaching, conveniently enough. Right. Hey, the people in the Old Testament, when they tithe, they had just as much pride. 10%, the law of percentage hasn't changed, friend. They right. paid 10% too of the same amount of whatever they had. Right. So think about that. Whatever struggle you have of tithing in the New Testament... Those of the Old Testament had the same struggle. It's 10%. I mean, how ridiculous can you possibly be? That's a terrible argument to say, well, I just can't afford, you know, I can't afford to be able to, to, be able to tithe. It's just stupid. It's a stupid argument. Amen. I can't afford to be able to give a free will offering. You're just not thankful is the problem. Don't tell me that. You just don't rejoice for the things that God has given you. Yeah. You know, I don't know what you're able to give. I don't know what it is. You know, but here's the thing. If someone is just, 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 they feel like, I don't want to give anything. Well, it's because you're not happy for what God has given you. You know why people gave free, free will offerings? You're like, man, it's not compulsory. It's not mandatory. Why are they, why are these people taking it? Because they're happy. Because they're happy for what God did for them in their life. For they're grateful and they're thankful for everything that God has given them. I want you to, I want, I want you to keep all these things that we just talked about in your mind. I want you to go back to 2 Corinthians, because the teaching that we saw in 2 Corinthians, chapter number 9, where we began, is the teaching of a free will offering. And it's not exclusive to that chapter. It's everything that we just read about just now. And all he's doing is, is speaking about a free will offering here in 2 Corinthians, chapter number 9. So go back there. Let's look at, uh, let's begin again in verse number 6. It says this in 2 Corinthians, chapter number 9, verse number 6. It says this. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. So what does it sparingly mean? He's saying he didn't get a lot. He's saying he's not going to get a lot back. We serve a just God. So when you give your money to the church, when you give to some spiritual ministry, a missionary or something like that, God will repay you in some way or another. If you give a little bit, God will pay you back a little bit. If you give a lot, God will pay you back a lot. Starting to sound like Benny Hinn up here, ain't I? <laughs> I hope everybody broke their checkbook today. <laughs> Deep down, did it. Look, look at verse 6. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Verse 7. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Notice what this is. What is it? It's of his own will, isn't it? It's voluntary. Every man, is, as he purposes in his heart, it's exactly the same as the free will offering in the Old Testament. You know why? Because God set up an offering, didn't he? But he said you don't have to give. He said at the feast of, of weeks, you'll, you shall give a free will offering, saying that's the type of offering to give, but you don't have to give. It's free will. That's the same exact thing that we're doing this morning. I've heard people say that before, like, how is it a free will offering if you guys are handing a plate? You know, down the... Yeah, we just got a free will offering here, and you guys are in the market, and you're handing a plate down the, down the aisles. Seems like you're kind of forcing everybody. No one's forcing you to give anything. Right. That's, that's a simplistic understanding. See how someone can have a very simple understanding of what the free will offering is? There, it's a type of offering that's instituted, but it's not mandatory. Don't feel compelled to put anything in that offering. And, and as a matter of fact, if you feel compelled, I'm telling you, don't put anything in the plate. If you feel forced, you're not giving a free will offering. Don't, don't give it to the church. Because if you, it's not a free will offering at that point. It's, you know, and, I'll, and look at this. Look at what it says, too, further on. On that same note. Every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give. Watch what it says next. Not grudgingly or of necessity. What does that mean? He doesn't want you to give it if it's of necessity. If it feels forced, if it feels mandatory to you, then don't give don't put anything in the plate. I'm as serious as can be. If you feel when we hand that offering plate around that it's forced, don't drop anything in it. Look at what it says next, too. For, because God loveth a cheerful giver. What's that sound like? Rejoicing. What were they supposed to do? When did they offer a free will offering? It's an offering of thanksgiving. 
When do they offer a free will offering? It's an offering because they're rejoicing, because they're happy, because they're cheerful. This is not of necessity. This is, he said, not grudgingly, because it's not mandatory, it's not forced, it's not your tithe, it's not a sin offering like they gave in the Old Testament, right? What is it? It's a free will offering. It's voluntary. You know why? God loves a cheerful giver. You know what he's saying here? It would be better, It would think about this, it would be better in that sense also if it is grudging. Don't give grudgingly. Don't give of necessity. It would be better in, in that sense not to give at all. He wants you to give and to be and to give and to be cheerful and to rejoice in this particular offering. Because the whole point, what should compel you to give in the first place is a thankful heart. Amen. It is a rejoicing, grateful heart. If you put money in that plate. It's not a free will offering if you feel compelled, if you feel that you have to do it. The whole reason that you're putting money in that plate is to say this. Hey, I am thankful for what God has done for me, and this is what I want to give to him because of that. That is a free will offering. If that plate gets passed around and you put money in it and you say, hey, I just, you know, I'll give this much. You know, I, you know, I can't really give any more, and I don't really want to give this in, it in the first place, so I'm just going to, you know, give you that that's not don't don't put it in it's better not to give it all not grudgingly not of necessity god loves a cheerful giver these are things actually you don't ever hear many men say ever god loves a cheerful giver you need to rejoice you need to be happy that's what should compel you to give that's what should get a person to the point where hey i want to give god this i want to Put a thought in your mind with that, uh, with, in line with that. Go to Psalm chapter number 50. Psalm chapter number 50. The book of Psalms, we're going to go to Psalm number 50. There's a, there's a famous verse I've heard quoted my whole life. We're going to read it here in just a moment. But we'll begin in Psalm 50. Look at verse 5. It says this. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And the heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God is, is judge himself. Selah. Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against thee. I am God, even thy God. I will not reprove thee for sacrifices or thy burnt offerings to have, to, to have been continually before me. I will take no bullet out of thy house, nor he goes out of thy fold. Watch what he says in verse 10. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. Now, I want you to understand the concept of what he's saying here. Back up to verse number 5 again. He says this. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. What's that sound like? Like a vow, doesn't it? They made a covenant with me by sacrifice, saying they're going to bring a sacrifice to me. And they, they uh, you know, uh, covenanted to bring it, didn't they, right? Well, look at verse 6. And, and the heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself. Selah. Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, I will testify against thee. I am God, even thy God. I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices or thy burnt offerings to have been continually before me. He says this. I will take no bullock out of thy house, nor he goes out of thy feet of folds. So what's he saying? I'm not going to take them. What's he saying? It's not going to be mandatory. He said, let them gather together that have made a covenant for my sacrifice. Why? Look at verse 10. For, meaning because, every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle upon a thousand hills. Now who's heard that verse many times quoted in their life? I've heard it tons of times. He, this is normally how people say it. He owns the cattle upon a thousand hills. That's like verbatim what people will normally say, right? You know what he's saying? Yeah, I, you know the ones I want to gather? I want the ones to gather together that made a covenant to sacrifice to me. The ones that come, and then he says this, because I'm not going to take the, the, I'm not going to take, you know, the sheep out of their fold. I'm not going to force the goats to be brought. Why? Because they're mine anyways. Yeah. I don't need anything in the first place. I, God has no necessities. God has no needs. Look at verse 11. I know all the fowls of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. Look at verse 12. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Verse 14. 
Offer unto God thanksgiving. And pay thy vows unto the Most High. You know what he's saying? Now he's saying he wants you to offer it, isn't he? He's saying he doesn't have to have it. He's not going to take it, take it himself. He wants you to bring it out of thanksgiving. He wants you to bring it out of your own heart, out of your own, out of your own will. He says, I'm not going to take it myself. You bring it. You bring it because you want to bring it. Offer un, you know, unto me thy sacrifice of thanksgiving, he says. He says in verse 14, offer unto God thanksgiving. And then he goes on and pay thy vows unto the, unto the most high. It's not forced. It's not mandatory. Think about this concept. God doesn't need anything from you in the first place. He needs nothing. He doesn't need your sacrifices. He doesn't need your vows. He doesn't need anything from you. Does God really need you financially to support him and to give money to him? Like, you know, I'm broke, I need money. That's ridiculous, isn't it? God doesn't need it. It's, it's for you, my friend. It's because you're thankful. It's because you're rejoicing. So you know what you do? You defeat the only purpose. The only purpose of the free will offering, if you give it, out of necessity. The only purpose is to give it because you're rejoicing. The only for purpose is to give it because you're thankful. The only purpose is to give it because, hey, I'm blessed from God, and I want to pay him back something just because I'm thankful for what he's done for me. Amen. And if you just say, hey, I'm just going to you know, give him ten bucks. He don't want your money because he doesn't need it, friend. He doesn't want you to put anything in the plate. He can, those are all, that, that, that cash you have in his wallet is his in the first place. He created this world. He's the God of all. That's his money. Your house technically is his. You know, all of the concrete, all of that, he made that when he spoke this world into existence. All of the wood that came from a tree that he created, my friend. Every, every piece of, every chemical, every material that is on this planet, he owns it. He owns everything. It's all his. He doesn't need you to bring it here and to give it to the church. That is not the point of a free will offering. Offer unto him thanksgiving. Nobody wants to bring, he wants to bring, he wants the, the saints. Gather unto him the saints that are thankful for what God has done for him. He wants you to bring it out of praise. God wants to be glorified by you. God wants you to rejoice and be thankful for the things that, that he has done for you. That is the purpose of a free will offering. I want you to go back to 2 Corinthians 9. We're going to end there at the end of the chapter in 2 Corinthians 9. Let me, uh, let me say this as well. Let me have a couple more points, actually, that I, that I did forget about. It's this. When you look in the Bible, you look at some of the great feats of, spiritually, the feats of the, of, um, the nation of Israel in the Old Testament of Old Testament Israel. The greatest feats are done through, spiritually, spiritual things are done through the free will offering. How is the tabernacle built? How is the tabernacle built? Just bring stuff unto me, whatever you want. He said the people bring too much, right? It was through free will offering. How was the temple rebuilt? The labor and the things that were brought were free will offerings. That's, the, you look up many times, the breaches, they wanted to repair the breaches. You know what they did? Just put something in the back, just let people give it what they want. People walk in, they just drop money into the, you know, they had a hole that they cut in it talks about, right? They put it in the back, and people just walk in, and they drop it in there, right in the very back. It's all free will offering. Let me say this. It's a thought that I, that I kind of uh, 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 dawned on me yesterday. The tithe, the stuff that's mandatory, like the commandment, that's minimal. If you're not tithing, you're not even minimal. You know what's going above and beyond? The things that God says, hey, this isn't necessary I'm sure God's tired of people trying to figure out what, you know, what the minimum is so they can just do the minimum. Right. God wants people. That's why he says in that exact chapter in Psalm 50, hey, I'm not going to take it myself. I'm not going to command this to you. I want someone that's thankful to bring it to me. I want someone out of their own heart who says, this is what I want to do. The types of churches that end up just staying minimal are because everyone's just doing the minimum. The church is that you want to grow, you want to be a better church, you want to be a greater church, well then we need to do greater things. And in all areas. And don't give me this crap, oh, you say I'm money to the business. Jesus said I must be about my father's business. In 1 Chronicles chapter number 9, it says that the singers of the, of the Kohathites, 
of the Levites are employed at this work day and night. That's employees, my friend. The, the Bible talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, pastors being paid. Now, I'm not paid from our church. I don't receive a regular check from our church because we're not to that point yet. But I, you know, as soon as I can, I will come on full time to the church because I want to do great things for God. Amen. And all of these churches that are, that are uh, you know, inhibiting their pastors from working or they tell them, oh, you should be an employee, they're going to do minimal works. They're hardly going to do anything because their pastor's working a full-time job. I work like 60 hours every week. I hardly have time even to do, you know, everything that I have to do for the church weekly with the job that I have now. Imagine doing that your whole life and pastoring a church and trying to invest all the time, trying to get the church to grow. It's almost like banging your head against the wall. It really is. It's a difficult job, especially when the church is new and it's just started up to get the church to grow. And what the, that's, a, that's you know, an evil heart when somebody tries to attack a church. They're like, oh, you know, you're, you're, here's the thing, idiot. The, the tithe in the Old Testament was meant to support the priests. Right. That was the whole purpose of it. When you read 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, some people, are, you know, I've heard people say this before. They're like, well, Paul, you know, people say, you know, follow me even as I, uh, you know, uh, follow me even as I follow Christ. That's the attitude that, that Paul said, right? That's what Paul told everyone. And all these people are saying, you know, they're following Paul. Well, Paul didn't get paid. Paul wasn't taking his own earnings. Paul tells you that in 1 Corinthians 9. He says that the whole reason that he does that is because so that he, and he's saying he doesn't have to. It's not compulsory. It ties in perfectly with this. He's saying, I could do what Peter does. I could do what all these other guys do. Don't I have the right to do these things? Right. And then he, he ends and concludes the whole chapter. I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. That's the whole point of that chapter. Yeah. He's saying, I'm doing every single thing that I can possibly do. Guess what? Paul wasn't married either. Right. Do I have to get married to follow Paul? I mean, not get married? Think about that. Do I have to make sure that I abstain from a relationship with a woman so that I can just follow Paul? That's stupid. That's, you're not understanding what that's saying. Right. That's ridiculous. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, Paul actually says, hey, I could get married just like Peter. Right. Hey, I could get paid. In the same way, I could get paid, but I don't. Right. That's the purpose of the chapter itself. Right. He talked, and that's where uh, we, we find the, is, what, did it go off or something? No. Is that what, that's where we find, where it talks about how, you know, how the laborer is worthy of his reward. Muzzle not the ox that treadeth out the corn. Right, amen. You know, here's the thing, too. This is the point. I don't care if I hair lift you or not. If I put hours in at this, at this church and I sit here and I labor day and night, my family is here every Saturday. I stop by this church at night probably two, three times a week. I'm here from like 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock Saturdays. I show up here super early on Sundays. I spend my entire day here. You guys go out soul winning, I realize that, but I'm here all day too while my family leaves. If you look at me and you say, hey, I don't think you should get paid, you're not right with God, my friend. Right. When you expect somebody to labor and not get paid for it, that's a wicked, stinking right. heart. Yeah, when you think I go to work all week and I don't get paid, the laborer is worthy of his reward. Don't give me this crap. All these congregational members, and I'm not saying it's you, but there's a bunch of congregational members that come in, they're at church three hours a week, and then they're complaining about the pastor being paid when he's there 60 hours. Shut your mouth. Right. That is wicked. You say, oh, you're just mad because you're the pastor. I'm mad because that's a wicked attitude. Right. That's an, an evil, wicked attitude for a person to have. Even you as the congregational member should be mad about that. Right. Don't sit there and tell somebody. I'm not mad for myself. I'm mad for all these stinking pastors that are out there laboring night and day, putting hours and hours and hours in. They're refraining from a relationship all the time with their family. And then you have the gall to try to tell them. You shouldn't get any money for that. What in the world is wrong with you? What kind of you know, reality are you live in, you idiot? Right. It's ridiculous. Right. Amen. You shouldn't get paid for that. Amen. You know what? If this offends you, then get your heart right with God. I don't hate you. Amen. Get your stinking heart right. Read, read 1 Corinthians 9 right. and see what it's telling you. You know what it tells you? The same way the priests got paid is the same way the pastors and the labor and the people that work for God, people that work in a legitimate ministry for God in the New Testament church should be supported by the church the same way they that labored for the temple in the Old Testament. Yeah. That's what 1 Corinthians 9 is teaching. Amen. 
Amen. That's what it is. That exactly is what it's saying. Turn there. Turn there real quick. Amen. Right. First Corinthians chapter number nine. <laughs> Sometimes the best parts of the sermon are the parts that aren't in my sermon itself. <laughs> Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. Look what it says. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. For the seal of my apostleship are ye in the Lord. My answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, watch this, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? What's he saying? <coughs> Don't I have power to get married? Just like Cephas? Can't I do that? Is there anything that's stopping me? No. He's saying I have the power. What does he mean by power? I have the ability to do that. I can do that. Right? Look at verse 6. For I only and Barnabas have not we power to forbear working. What does that mean? saying, don't I have the power to stop working my secular job? Is he saying just to stop working at all? He's saying, don't I have the power to stop? Like, what do I, you know, when I get home, what do you guys say? Daddy's home from what? From work. That's what he's saying. From working, from going to a, to a job like that every day. It's not that I would prevent from laboring at all, but to forbear working my secular job. Can't I just serve God in the ministry? That's what he means. To prove that a little further. Verse 7. Who goeth the warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? What's he saying? Who would plant a vineyard and not eat of that fruit? Yeah. It's saying, apply to myself. Why would someone come here, let's say I work full time for the church, and work all day and then not eat of the fruits in some way or another? Right. Think about that. I'm going to come and I'm going to labor here all day, but then they're like, no. We're not paying you a dime. Get back to work, buddy. It's like, what the world? You know, that's the attitude that these people try to have. And it's all the same people that are like, oh, you should have a bishop running the church. There shouldn't be a leader. It's like, they want no structure, no authority is what it is. That's the problem with a lot of this. A lot of them are good-hearted people. They get caught, you know, up in, in, in stupid stuff. Some of them just have a rebellious spirit about it. Right. Look at what it says next here. Verse... Eight. Or we'll continue reading in verse 7. And eateth not of the fruit thereof, or who feedeth the flock, and eateth not of the milk of the flock. Think about that. Who, what, what is it called when a pastor stands up and preaches? Feeding the flock. And I can't eat of the milk of the flock? Give me some milk. I'm thirsty. <laughs> right? It's ridiculous. Amen. It is. Amen. Right. Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also. Do you know what he's saying right there? You know what people like to do? Right now they like to say, you're just saying that because you're the pastor. He's saying, say I these things as, the, as a man. It's just because I'm, I'm a man, like in the flesh. When he, when he makes a statement like that, that's what he's saying. And then, he, then he, you know what he does? He's saying the law says the same thing I'm saying. Don't just say I'm just saying this. Look at the law too. Look at what it says. Verse 9. For it is written in the law of Moses, thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Does God take care for us? Does God care about this? The reason why God wrote this in the scriptures is because he, he cares about you know, the poor oxen not being fed up there. Look at verse 10. Where saith he it all together for our sakes. For our sakes, no doubt. This is written that he that plow, ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. So saying the way that I benefit you spiritually I, you know, in whatever way, I can get paid back from that. If I feed the flock, then I can receive the milk back off of that flock. That's what it's saying. Look at verse 11. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Think about this. How much wicked it makes it. What's greater, spiritual things or carnal things? That's the point he's making. He's saying, if I sow unto you spiritual things, is it a big deal if I reap carnal things? Why? You know what that, that, that means? You're more worried, you know, you have a pastor, maybe you have a great pastor who's up here feeding you with great knowledge, all this stuff that's worth way more than the money in your pocket, Amen. but you're too stinking covetous. That money's probably more important to you than the spiritual knowledge you're receiving. That's probably what's going on, and you don't want to give, get rid of that. When the money in your pocket, that's a lot less important in reality than the spiritual knowledge that you're being fed. 
Amen. saying it's not a why, you think that's a big deal that's his point you think it's a big deal for me to you know uh, uh, you know sow spiritual things to you all week and to teach you things all week but then I can't even you know reap anything you know even carnal things from you you know it's it's a, it's a very wicked attitude keep reading he says this verse twelve if others be partakers of power over you are not we rather so he's speaking from personal right now he's saying. If other people, if you pay other people, he's saying, are not we rather like Paul as an apostle and then also spiritually, just in general? <clears throat> are, we not, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power but suffer all things lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Now, this is a personal decision of Paul. I'm referring that to you. Verse 13. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? And they that wait at the altar are partakers of the altar. What is that saying? What did they do at the altar? Do you know what the tithe, the purpose of the tithe is? It was the sustenance. It was the food for the priest. They ate it, my friend. They ate the tithe. God didn't need it. He owns all the sheep and the goats. But you know what? He wanted a system in place to where he could, he wanted people working full time for him. He wanted sacrificing the sacrifices given to him. So you know what? He said, you know what I'll do? I'll double the sacrifices and I'll feed my workers so they can work there day and night. Amen. Amen. That's the point of it. See, here's the thing. God himself doesn't benefit from you. He owns it in the first place, like he says. You know what it does? It enables people to be full time. Employees. It enables, and, and, and if the word employee offends you, then First Chronicles chapter nine offends you too. It says they are employed in the work night and day. Jesus said, "We're about. I must be about my Father's business." This is seriousness here. Amen. That's why people that, that kind of stuff bothers them because they're probably not working. They're probably not serving God. How I many? How often are you going soul winning? How often are you, you know, reading your Bible? Are you actually doing work for the Lord? Real work where you're laboring and working. On things that are related to the, you know, the, uh, the God and spiritual things. How often? Because if that offends you, it's probably because you're not doing work and you don't want to be, a, you know, a part of business. You don't want to be a part of serving God and laboring and things of that sort. <clears throat> and then he goes on, like I said, uh, look at verse 14. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. But all the apostles traveled around. They were supported by the people they were preaching to. People would feed them. They had a bag. They had a bag that Judas kept, and they would put the money in the bag. It's money that people were giving to them. Right. That they were preaching. You know what they're doing? They were preaching spiritual things, and then they were reaping carnal things. Right. Right. That's what this clearly is teaching. It's clearly teaching that Paul has the power to do so, but then he goes on and says that. He doesn't do this because he doesn't want to make his glory in void. That's his personal decision. That's where people don't understand this. Peter made a decision and said, you know what, I'm going to get married. Paul made a personal decision. That's what he just likened that to. So keep those two things together in your mind. In the same way that Paul said, hey, I'm, not going, I'm going to work a, a, a full-time job and not be paid just by the church alone. You know, because he wants to not make his glory void. In the same way as that, Paul also made the decision, I'm not going to get married. But he says this. Can, can, can I get married though? Don't I have the power to get married? To lead about a sister or wife? Right? And then he says right in the same breath, likening these two things to one another. Right after that, he says, do not I have, how do you word it, power to forbear working? Where's that verse? Have, we, have not we power to forbear working? That's his work, his labor, his fellow labor of Barnabas. So he says, or I only and Barnabas have not we power to forbear working. He's saying, can't I stop working and be supported by the carnal things and those that I'm reaping the spiritual things, and those that I'm selling the spiritual things to? Can I reap the carnal things? That's what he's saying. So don't have the attitude, oh, you shouldn't, you know, churches should be ran like a business. Church, it is a business. It's work. We're doing work. You know, that is what we're doing here. That's the purpose of this church. It's not just gather here. Hey, I love fellowshipping. I love, you know, you know, hanging out and having fun with everybody. But there's labor to do, my friend. There's work to do to Amen. serve the Lord. When I started this church, that I have goals that I want to accomplish. And you know what it takes to get to those goals? Work. Amen. Labor. Serving God. You know what it takes? You better be about business if you want.
want to do something with your church. If you want to pastor someday, you better have the mentality that we are running this thing in aspects like a business. Because there is work to do and we have goals. We need to sit down and assess the situation. How are things going? If we added new members, or if that's not working, we need a new, we need to revert to a new plan. Things like that. It's like a business. We need to, you know, serve the Lord and work and labor. That's what a business is. Somewhere it's a place of work, isn't it? It's a place where you labor. All right, go to 2 Corinthians. We'll end there now. 2 Corinthians chapter number 9. Is the hair off or is it just me? It's off. It is burning up. Somebody turn the hair off, please. 2 Corinthians chapter number 9. Now, back to the free will offerings. So, here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 9, I want to begin, I want to end here in the last three verses of the chapter. Or 4, 12 through 15. I want you to look at uh, verse number 4, and I want to put a thought in your mind that, that you carry with you throughout the time when you, when you give. Let me review quickly a few things. Number one, don't put anything in that plate. Don't at all put anything in that plate if you feel that it's a necessity. Number one, needs to be of your own free will. Number two, what compels you? It's not compulsory, but what would compel you? Your inner heart, your inner man. You're not compelled from anything external. It would be interior. It would be of your own free will. It's voluntary, right? Now, number three, what is the purpose, though? It's what is it that's actually compelling you? The fact that you're thankful. The fact that you're rejoicing. The fact that you are, you know, grateful to the Lord for all the things that he's done for you. That's what would get you to, to give in the first place. Now, I, wanna, I, want, I want you to, to understand uh, the difference between, and I, I want to liken this quickly just in an analogy, to works and grace. Now, the commandment, the law is what? It's works. But what is, what is you know, uh, 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 grace? There's nothing involved except your own free will. Now, I want to, uh, it's a gift, isn't it? Think about that. Is a gift something mandatory that you have to? No, it's not, is it? A gift is something that, that you would just give. It's your money, and you just decide, hey, I just want to give this to you. Right? Look at, look at how it ends, too. It's very, it's very interesting. Look at how the end of this chapter concludes. Look at verse 12. For the administration of this service, notice that. Kind of sounds like a business, doesn't it? For the administration of this service, not only supply the want of the saints. He's saying, so number one, hey, we're supplying what people need when you give. <coughs> the want of the saints. But it's abundant also by, look at this, many thanksgivings unto God. And do you think that's a coincidence that's found in a chapter? The only, one of the only times free will offerings are mentioned in the New Testament. See the consistency of the Old Testament? But also it's, it's the thanksgivings. Verse 13, while by the experiment of this ministration, they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ. And then he says this, and for your liberal, that's like, like free, right? Distribution unto them and unto all men. Verse 14, and by their prayer for you, which long after you, for the exceeding grace of God in you. Notice how he's, now he's relating this like unto, they're, they're being gracious by giving this, aren't they? Right? Would you say that it's gracious to give your tithe? Would you say that? No, you're forced. You see how these two things are very similar? He's saying the grace that is in you. The Bible talks about how the grace of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to us. Why? Why would you be gracious? Because you were given grace from God. Why would you give someone else a gift? Because you have been given a gift from God. I want you to look at what he likens this unto. Look at the perfect ending, verse 15. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. What's the thanks about? What's he talking about? Their liberal distribution. Do you know what should cause you to be thankful to put money in that plate? Don't feel I'm compelling you. I'm just saying if your heart was right. You know what would compel a person to give for a free will offering? Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Amen. Maybe he ain't got nothing on this. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but think about that. I mean... It's a gift that's, that, that's like any other gift. It's a gift that's, that, that, I mean, you can't even put it into words. It, it truly is unspeakable. You can't even explain it. What God did for us, you can never repay him. It doesn't matter if you had a, a, a zillion dollars dropped into that plate, man. You know, that's speakable. 
What he gave you is unspeakable. You know what should compel you to give him free will offerings? You know what it should be? What God's done for you. You know a good example of that, the best example, is being thankful for his unspeakable gift that he gave to you. And then you give back. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for everything you've done for us. We thank you for, uh, we thank you for this church. We thank you for our family.